in uh, careers in music. With us tonight is the president of the Florida Music Education Association, Dr. Steve Kelly. Dr. Kelly, would you like to say hi to everybody? Oh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to a uh, continuation in the <laughs> webinars here. Uh, already have a critic there. <laughs> uh, we're so glad that you're able to join us tonight. I know the weather is not great in many areas of the country, and I know uh, this is streaming uh, outside of Florida as well. And it's also President's Day, and a lot of us had school off today. So I want to thank you for uh, taking your time to come and be a part of this. This is going to be an extremely exciting webinar. And thank you, Dr. Antman, and all the presenters for being here tonight. And uh, we hope that you get the most out of it. So thank you again for being here. Okay. So as we're going through the uh, session, by the way, this is a one hour session. So we will be uh, wrapping up at 7.30. Everybody's gonna get a, you're, you're gonna get a chance to hear from all of our panelists. Then we're gonna kind of take some of your questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and I can read them to them. Or if you wanna raise your hand at some point, I think you have the ability to unmute if you, if you have a question that you wanna ask yourself after they're done talking to you. But tonight you're gonna hear from a professional musician who's in uh, one of the military bands. You're gonna hear from a sound engineer. You're gonna hear from an elementary music teacher. You are going to hear from a music therapist. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a choral director on the program tonight. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it right at 6.30. He might be in a little bit later, but if you have a question about um, teaching high school music or middle school music, I'd be glad to answer that for you. Or college music, our, our FMEA president, Dr. Steve Kelly, can also answer those questions for you as we get going. Uh, as you're listening tonight, I want you to think about are they doing things that interest you? So a lot of times when we're in high school, we're like, okay, I wanna do music, but we don't know exactly what we wanna do. And so we always think there's only two options when it comes to teaching music. One, if you're a band student, I can be a band director or I can be a band performer. And there really, there are lots of other opportunities out there for you to consider. So our panelists tonight will tell you about them, uh, how they got their job, what they did to get to their job and, and maybe what inspired them when they were a high school student. And tonight we're gonna start with uh, Brian Bloom, who is a percussionist with the uh, U.S. Army Pershing's own band in Washington, D.C. Mr. Bloom. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for letting me be a part of this, um, kind of representing the performance side and more specifically the military musician side of things this evening. Um, just a little background on kind of my musical journey to this point. I recently joined this band, so this is a pretty new thing for me. Um, but I grew up in rural Indiana. Um, my dad was a band director. And when I finally decided to pursue music, I knew I didn't want to be a band director. <laughs> um, based on just the, the, the way that he, you know, the, the lifestyle and just I saw enough of that. I thought, well, maybe I want to I want to be a little bit more of a performer. Studied uh, music performance for undergraduate and master's degrees and um, decided by the end of that time that I think I, you know, I really want to teach college. Freelance for a few years, uh, a lot of teaching, writing, performing uh, in the Indianapolis area before I got a job in Lakeland, Florida at Southeastern University. And I taught percussion and music there for seven years. And, um, but I still had a little bit of that I want to be a performer uh, in me and and was kind of looking for different opportunities if it came up. I had a good friend here in the army band that told me about some openings a um, year and a half ago or so coming up and I thought, well, I don't know. I don't know, but I'll, I'll just go see what happens. I never had planned to be to do the military musician thing, um, considered the orchestral route. But anyway, long story short, I went through the audition process. Um, highly competitive audition process for this particular band and, and wound up here. Um, I won the audition a little over a year ago and went through basic training, army basic training this past summer, joined the band in uh, late July, early August. And I am in the ceremonial band of the US Army Band, which is stationed in Washington, DC. It's a permanent station here in DC. Um, and I'm gonna share a screen because a lot of times people are like 
it's very difficult. I even I I was like this even going through the audition process. I didn't really understand. Okay, there's I hear about all these different bands and the Army band and the Army Field band and so and so's in the West Point band and and then there's the Navy and the Air Force. There's a lot of different things. So I'm gonna try to clear a little bit of that up for you and try to at least give you an idea of what we're talking about. And I'll start if I can. Yes, share this part of my screen. Um, let me know if you can see that. A little nod. Yes, okay, great. So this is just specifically for the Army, right? Um, to, just to show you kind of where I fit in this mix and to show you some of the other opportunities, right? So the Army bands are essentially divided into kind of two categories, the premier bands um and then the the regional bands and there are four premier bands which you see listed there um and the one in the red box is the group that i'm a part of and then i'm specifically in the ceremonial band um, this u.s army band contains all of these different uh elements they call them different ensembles within that and you can see already like i had no idea that there was a pop ensemble in the army band and many of you may not realize that there's there's a they call downrange. The U.S. Army Field Band has a group called Six String Soldiers. Um, they actually performed in Lakeland a couple years ago, and uh, they do like bluegrass music. So many opportunities like that. So then there, there's those premier bands, which are mostly stationed around this area, and then the uh, West Point Band at the Academy, and then there are a whole bunch of regional bands, some active duty bands um, stationed around the, around the country, around some overseas, and then some you know, part-time National Guard and Reserve bands. And then each, basically each um, branch has a similar structure. The Army has the most because it's the largest branch. Uh, they have the most number of bands, but basically each branch has a premier band in DC and then several regional fleet field bands or whatever they call them kind of around the around the country and a few overseas as well. So there, there, it's kind of a range of options and, and there are different routes to getting into those bands, depending on what it is. Like for my band, the audition was uh, posted. I applied to audition, sent in some pre-screen materials. They invited me to a live audition. And then once I was selected, um, I had to, then I went through the full process of enlisting in the army and then going through all of that. There are other routes, depending on the branch and the band, where sometimes you might enlist first and go through um, a certain process in, in uh, basic training, things like that, before you kind of start getting into the, the music side of things. But those, I would say that the best jobs are gonna be like the former description that I kind of explained, where you're gonna audition first uh, and make sure you kind of secure a spot in one of those ensembles. So. Uh, my specific job in the ceremonial band today is um, supporting largely ceremonies here in the capital region. Um, I, I do a lot of ceremonies, funeral ceremonies in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, that's probably a majority of what I do is playing music for those and, and leading troops through the cemetery. Um, I was part of the inauguration ceremony a few weeks back here in DC, uh, marching the president to the White House and doing a pass and review um, we play for dignitaries that come through um, November 11th, Veterans Day. I did. I was at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for President Trump at the time, and it's um, already just in a few months. Played for a couple different presidents, and it's really, really, really cool. Um, kind of like got to pinch myself sometimes that I get to play music for a living in in such a cool place. It's you know all the. I can share more later if you want to know about you know just the why uh, I would want a job like this and stick with it. Um, but there are a lot of perks, a lot of benefits. Um, very happy to be here. All right, thank you. And we'll come back. I actually, I have a couple questions for you, but we're gonna let everybody talk and then I'll, I'll come back, sure. uh, back around to that in a second. Very good. Um, so, and we good to move on now? Yeah, yeah, for me, okay. go ahead. All right. I thought I heard you say something a second ago. Um, <clears throat> next, we're going to hear from Nicole Kirby, who's a music therapist. And I, I, we talked before this session earlier today, and I said, you know, I have students at school all the time. They're like, I'm going to go into music therapy. And then I say, do you know what that is? And they're like, no, no, I don't. So maybe you can teach us a little bit about music therapy tonight and tell us about what you do. 
Yes. Let me just say that I'm so happy to be here. Um, I fell into that category where I was in high school and I knew I wanted to do something with music. And I thought my only two options were performance or were band director. Um, I played trombone in high school and in college. And I thought those were my two only two options. Um, I knew I wasn't good enough to be a performer. So I said, I guess I'll be a band director. Um, I went to Florida State University and um, in my first year there, I learned what music therapy was. Um, I was actually doing a psychology study and one of the psychologists who was doing the study um, asked me what my major was and we got talking and she said that she used to be music therapy, but she liked the brain side better than the music or a little bit more than the music side. So I just finally asked what even, what is music therapy? I had seen signs all over the College of Music, but I didn't know what it was. Um, so she explained it to me and I was immediately interested in it. And I think it was the next day that I talked to my advisor, my lessons teacher. And within that week I had switched to music therapy and I have not looked back since. I absolutely love it. Um, I currently work as the music therapist at Nemours Children's Hospital. So I'm a medical music therapist. Um, I'm going to share my screen and go through just a, a quick PowerPoint just to kind of give you guys the basics of what music therapy is and what music therapists do and where we work to get a little bit more information for you guys. All right, and let me know if you guys have any trouble seeing my screen at all. All right, so I am a board certified music therapist and what music therapists do, this uh, definition is from the American Music Therapy Association. It is that music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish, accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. That's a mouthful. So in my elevator speech, I always um, just kind of simplify it to music therapy is the use of music to achieve non-music related goals. So I've italicized some of the words here, kind of the buzzwords within the definition. Um, music therapy is evidence-based. Um, we do have two music therapy journals. All of our interventions um, have been researched and proven effective. So it's not just someone coming out of the, you know, who plays guitar from the street and just decides they want to do music therapy. Um, our goals are individualized, so it depends on the patient. There's different goals for different patients. And then it's by a credentialed professional. So each music therapist has to go through an approved music therapy program in a, um, in a college or university and then um, do an internship as well as take a board certification exam. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more in our, our next slides. Um, so I'm just gonna go a little bit quickly over this, but music is so effective in music therapy because it affects so many different parts of your brain, basically all of them. Um, as you can see on this, this screen here um, in the different parts of the brain, just specifically what music does for you. So um, I, see, I see this a lot in commercials and in videos, feel good videos of um, older adults who have Alzheimer's who may not be able to remember their own daughter's name or their grandchildren's name or where they grew up, but you put on a song from when they were in their teens or their early 20s and they'll start singing all the words and they just light up. And part of that is because once one of your um, areas of your brain may be damaged, since music is connected to so many different parts of your brain, it helps to reconnect those, um, those different pathways to create um, a moment like that. So that's one of the reasons that music is so effective in so many different parts. Um, it affects the emotional system, it affects your memory, um, it has the ability to block your perception of pain. It's just so useful in so many different ways. So what exactly do music therapists do? Um, so we assess individuals in the following areas, emotional well-being, physical health, social functioning, communication, and cognitive skills. And then once we've assessed those areas, we find the areas that we need to work on with those individuals. And we use different interventions such as music listening, songwriting, lyric analysis, playing instruments, instrument listening to um, some music production, and then movement to music 
to help meet the needs of those areas that we have assessed. Um, so this is an exhaustive list, really. Um, music therapists use a lot of different instruments as well of, as non-instruments. Um, but some of the most common ones are guitar and piano. Uh, as a music therapist in, in school, we learn um, guitar and piano just because guitar is mostly guitar because gar guitar is so, um, so easy. It's compact, so you can take it with you. And then you can also use patient preferred music so you can sing songs with guitar. Um, and then there's a bunch of different instruments listed there. Those are ones that I specifically use often in my practice. But as I said before, this list is exhaustive. Any instrument you think of, you can use in a music therapy session, as long as it's therapeutic and helping to meet the goals of those patients. So music therapists work in a lot of different areas. They can work in uh, patient homes. They can work in private practice facilities, hospitals, prisons, schools, nursing homes specific treatment facilities like rehab programs. Um, and there's a lot of different types of, of session types. So you can have a one-on-one -on -one session where you're working with one specific individual, or you can have a group session where you're working with a bunch of different people and working on that interaction. Um, and now because of COVID, we can do virtual sessions as well. So yay, <laughs> kind of exploring um, new territories that way. I'm gonna kind of breeze through this section a little bit of the different populations. Um, that music therapists work, work with. But if you see a specific population you're interested in and have additional questions, you can kind of jot those down um, to ask maybe a little bit later. So music therapists work in mental health settings. So that can be um, with veterans who have PTSD. It can be in correctional facilities, so in prisons. It can be rehabilitation centers, such as um, abuse centers or addiction recovery centers or it can be in specific behavioral health units um, within a hospital or their own facilities. Music therapists can work with special needs patients as well. So that includes autism, Down syndrome, patients who have developmental disabilities and delays. Um, there's a whole list there of different types of delays that can fall into this category. Um, and this, this, uh, these patients can be served in schools, in private settings, in homes. Um, in a lot of those settings that we listed earlier. Music therapists also work with older adults. Um, they can work in nursing homes, in senior centers, um, for wellness sessions, um, with Alzheimer's, in hospice. So a large variety of, of different areas that music therapists can work. And then in the medical setting, I'll go a little bit further into this since it's, it's the area that I work in um, now. So different medical populations include hospice, rehabilitation centers, hospitals, so that can be adult hospitals, children hospitals, there's a lot of combinations of adult hospitals with a children's unit. Um, and then if we're getting a little more specific our neonatal intensive care units. So those are babies that are born a little bit too early and they need a little bit of extra love and care before they get taken home. Um, so we had mentioned different goals in that each patient has an individualized goal program. Um, so some of these common goals that we work on within the medical setting is reducing pain and anxiety using that can be instrument play, it can be relaxation exercises, um, it can be songwriting, different things to help distract the patient, procedural support, so if they're getting an IV or if they're getting um, a pick line, some different kinds of procedures, we can use music to help distract them from those developmental support. So we do have patients who are in the hospital for a very long time. Um, and that can kind of stunt their growth a little bit um, physically and mentally. So we can use music to help meet their milestones, such as grasping and tracking and eye contact, um, reinforcement of goals with other therapies as well, normalization of the hospital environment. It can be very scary being in the environment in a new place, especially for kids at the children's hospital. So just helping to make it feel a little bit more comfortable. And then self-expression and coping. So again, just giving them another means of expressing themselves while they're in the hospital. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this slide a little bit just for sake of time. Um, so how do you guys become a music therapist if you're interested? So as I stated before, um, music therapists need to go through an approved college program. So there's bachelor's, master's equivalency, master's programs, and PhD programs um, within the state of Florida the um, approved music therapy programs are Florida State University, the University of Miami, and Florida Gulf Coast University. 
within your coursework, you also have to do clinical hours. So um, some of that is included within your coursework, like their practicums. Um, and then post coursework, you will do an internship, which is 900 hours. That usually roughly turns out to be six months. Once you finish that and you graduate, you take a board certification exam. Um, and then once you do that, you can go and practice music therapy. And similar to a lot of other professions, you have to do continuing education and development. So you have to meet a certain amount of points of doing um, different education opportunities, going to conferences, getting certifications and, and different things like that. Um, and the last thing really quickly, I've, I've done this, this um, PowerPoint in this kind of discussion on music therapy before, and a lot of high school students ask me what kind of classes music therapists take. Um, so this is the degree program that I did through Florida State University. Um, so a lot of schools look a little bit different, but they all have the same basic things that you need to take. Um, so on the left side are the music studies. Those are a lot of the classes that all music majors take. Um, and then on the right side, on the top, you have just some general academic courses. And on the bottom, um, the supportive courses in music are a little bit more specific to music therapy. Um, so it's kind of a variety of different things. And you, your guidance counselor usually gives you kind of a suggested route. Um, but this is just a little bit, you can look at it on the Florida State University website, or even if you just search music therapy, music therapy uh, plan a study, program a study, um, for whatever school you're interested in, this something similar to this will usually pop up. So that's just a little bit, let me stop sharing my screen. That's just a little bit about music therapy in general. I know that's a lot of information. It's sometimes, it's sometimes um, difficult to just kind of put music therapy into one short five minute talk. So I'm happy to answer whatever questions you guys have towards the end. Um, and reach out to me via email, but I'm so happy to be here and to be able to just educate you guys on what music therapy is because I, I remember being in your position and I really wish that there was something like this to just kind of learn a little bit more about it. So thank you guys. Well, and thank you. And it sounds like there's so much more to music therapy than I think people realize. And just looking through that, there are so many, so many different specialties within music therapy, so many different applications. And, you know, I just a side note, and then we're going to move on to the next person. But um, I've had students ask before, I want to do music therapy, but I, I really want to play my instrument in college. It is a music degree. You're getting a music degree when you're a music therapist and you're still playing in band or singing in choir and all music degrees generally start pretty much the same and require you first to be a musician and then you get into your specialization. So thank you for sharing the course progression with them at the end, because I think that's that's really important to see. Uh, next, speaking of lots of applications, uh, is Matt Brown, who's a uh, music production sound engineer guy in Central Florida. And people always like wonder, are there jobs? Are there jobs? Man, with all the entertainment industry in Florida, it seems like you're kind of an important guy. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I guess I guess you could say that. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so, uh, I'm I guess the correct term for me for my work would be an audio engineer. Um, but that my path towards audio engineering was kind of uh, inherited, but also kind of made from a path of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with music. Um, so my quick story is uh, I started playing drums when I was three. My dad was a drummer. My mom was a clarinet player. They met in high school band and ended up getting married. And uh, so I started playing music at a very young age at the time. When I was uh, you know, three to seven years old, my dad was in a touring uh, Christian folk band that was actually pretty big. So it was kind of all I, music was always around me and there was never, you know, not playing music was it was just like, hey, you can do music for a career if you want. You just have to figure out what you want to do. So I played uh, most of my life. I went to middle school, high school band. Um, in high school, uh, you know, 15 years old, my dad had uh, had the recording bug. So he started when I was very young. Uh, he started his own like recording studio in his house and kind of taught himself and ended up getting a very big job with a company called Har Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, which is now Harcourt Brace, which is a big publisher. So you might have one of Harcourt Brace's books um, in your studies. So he became the house engineer for Harcourt Brace. Um, 
when they downsized, basically when Anheuser-Busch bought, uh, bought SeaWorld and the Bush Gardens and all that stuff, um, Harker Brace downsized. So they basically got rid of his department that he helped build. And at that time, he decided to start his, you know, his own studio and pick up all the work. And that was in 1990. So that was my sophomore year in high school. Uh, my junior year in high school, he had made the switch to be one of the first people in, in the Southeast pretty much to uh, start with digital audio, which is the first version of, of a software called Pro Tools. But it was basically taking audio out of the analog world, which had only lived on tape before and putting it in a computer. So at that point, he saw, you know, he was working, had quite a lot of work and saw a need for an editor um, and basically taught me how to edit uh, audio on Pro Tools. Um, so that was my first job as in high school. Well, actually, it was my second job. My second job, my first job was bagging groceries, but my second job was working for him. So I was kind of doing both for a while. And uh, I was still playing in high school, but I really wanted to play. I wanted to be a performer. Um, and I, my main instrument is drum set, but I ended up doing concert and marching percussion as well. And uh, I ended up going to University of Central Florida um, for what I thought was music education when I first en enrolled. And then I quickly realized I wanted to be a performance major. So I switched. Um, while I was at UCF, I started working at Disney as a college musician. And during my course of working at Disney while in school, I also met a lot of players that were playing in the professional bands at Disney. And my junior year in college, a substitute musician spot opened up for the Kids of the Kingdom, which which was the castle shows, the shows that used to happen in front of the castle. And there was a band there. Um, I ended up landing the audition and got the sub spot, which was great. And then quickly realized that between a seven day band, there was a lot of work to be had as a substitute musician. And I moved up very quickly to be the first call. So this is one of those life decision places where I didn't really have time to go to school anymore. And I was already playing with professionals that I had, you know, wanted to be playing with and that were my father's age. So I kind of turned left and uh, went straight into performance full time. All the while I was still recording and working part time for my dad when need be. And, um, you know, in that path, I also in the recording path, I also found the need for to really kind of learn my instrument in a different way than everybody else was not just the playing ability, not just being able to read music or whatever, but I wanted to learn because I was involved in recording. I want to learn how to make the drums sound as good as possible, which meant diving into the physics of how drums work and learning, uh, you know, not just how to tune drums, but like the differences that every single piece of the drum made and how that affected, you know, the overall sound and which microphone to use and where to put it and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, kept going playing started become started picking up studio work as a drummer um playing on a national rock recordings uh some of which i can't tell you who are some some of which i can uh so i was hired to basically replace people on records and be the drummer but also a good portion of that time i was you know kind of helping engineer the drums because i knew as much as whoever I was working with or the producer actually trusted me enough to just say, hey, yeah, just go ahead, and put the mics up wherever you want. Um, through that playing as a studio musician, musician, I also started working with bands as a producer as well um, and kind of taking local bands and recording them and mixing them and all of that stuff. Um, I took a slight detour for about five years where I was a touring drummer with two different bands. I toured with a band called Bad Company, which is a classic rock 70s band. And then I switched over to a hard rock band uh, called 10 Years out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and when I was let go of that band, I kind of was like, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Like, I've done the performance thing. I'm in my mid 30s. I don't want to be on the road anymore. So I shifted back into the recording uh, side of things full time and uh, started you know, basically started by building a studio out of a place that I had worked and started working with bands around town. And since then, I've worked with uh, some major artists, including a uh, classic uh, rock artist and Hall of Famer John Anderson of Yes. Um, 
I'm currently working with Robbie Steinhardt, who's the violin player for Kansas. I'm working on a record for him. Um, I've also become an online educator for an, uh, for an online recording school called the Ultimate, um, uh, sorry, Unstoppable Recording Machine Academy, URM Academy. Um, and with that uh, online academy, I uh, developed a fully encompassing recording drums course that is a 70, something like 70 hours or 70 videos of the how to record drums from the beginning of like what is a drum and how does it work all the way to the final mix of uh, drums uh, drum tracks on a recording and also because I'm so kind of juggling a bunch of jobs as a sound engineer or an audio engineer um, I also have a lot of opportunity to do things that are kind of a little bit out of the norm and not necessarily music related but um, the helping development products development of products such as microphones um, even drums and stuff like that. So there's a there's a lot of versatility involved because I have to, I had to learn like not only just you know the software but the physics. Um, I do a consulting as an acoustic acoustician, um, help design studios for not only people's homes but you know big big major studios and stuff like that. So it's kind of one of those things where I just keep a, as many balls in the air as I can, so to speak, and juggle and juggle and juggle. But um, there is a lot of work. I've done work for Disney and Universal recently, um, and uh, it's, it's a very rewarding job because I don't do the same thing every day. It's kind of wake up in the morning and go, oh, well, what do we have on the on the on the uh, plate for today's work? And it's always something different. Some of it gets very boring and meticulous because you have to you know, zoom in with a microscope and look at why a waveform is popping when it shouldn't be. Um, and, but some of it is very creative and fun. So it's it kind of works for me because I'm kind of very analytical, but also very creative at the same time. So it's kind of a perfect fit for for my life, really. <laughs> well, and just just like all these jobs, it seems like it's always changing. There's always updating. And, and I, I think for me, that's one of the reasons I love what I do. And I love music is that you're never there. There's always something more to learn and it's always changing. And I, and we, you know, I was talking to Mr. Brown today, I found my music technology book from college in my office today. And one of the chapters is devoted to how to use the floppy disk and man, how things have changed. And, you know, I was in college just like a year ago. So, I mean, that, that happened really quickly. Um, and so last, and certainly not least, we're going to hear from Mrs. Hewitt, who is a uh, music educator here in Orange County. And I remember I heard one of her groups perform at the Apopka Art and Jazz Festival. Oh. This, is, this is five or six years ago. And I remember being on stage saying to myself, man, these kids can do more than some of the middle school and high school kids in our county. The things that elementary music teachers are able to do is absolutely amazing. Can you tell us about what you do and how you got there? Sure. Um, first of all, I think you said, say where we're we from. So I don't know if you see, I am Stetson. I'm a Stetson graduate here in Florida. And that's how I came to Florida because I grew up in the orchestra system um, in South Carolina, which is a pretty big thing in South Carolina. Uh, I teach music kindergarten through fifth grade, six classes a day for 45 minutes each one. I also have a chorus and an ORF ensemble before school. Right now with the pandemic, it's about 600 students. Our, our numbers are down a little bit, um, but I have them all within a week in various platforms. I have face-to-face -face kids. I have online, which is launch ed in Orange County, and I have hybrid, uh, which is some are in the building and some are out of the building. Uh, very challenging times, but it's been teaching us that we can innovate and that we can learn new things, which is always a good thing for our brains. I am an ORP certified teacher, which means I have three levels of teacher education plus master class with this approach, um, which is sanctioned by the um, American ORP Shore Association. Uh, what I like about this approach is that it uses singing, speech, body percussion, listening, instrument playing, and movement to develop artistry and musicianship in the students with the ability to create and compose their own music. So improvisation is something we try to do in every class in my room. Uh, what I do, I feel, is foundational to music learning and skill building. We develop beat awareness, 
pitch awareness, melody, rhythm, expression in music, ensemble playing. Uh, we do recorders, ukuleles, percussion, which is pitched and unpitched. And all that leads to successful pursuits in middle school, high school, and beyond. Um, I, one of my goals is not to have all my students become professional musicians, but I want them to feel comfortable participating in music for life, either by doing music or by being patrons and supporters of music. Um, how did I decide to come to elementary? Well, originally, I was going to be a string teacher and because I'm a bass player, went through school orchestras, did all state, um, did all those things. And, you know, sadly, there are a lot of people that come to elementary school that they don't do that on purpose. That wasn't their goal. Their goal was to be the secondary teacher, which is great because, you know, we, we do love our um, our band directors and our orchestra directors, our our music theater people, all those people have invested in us and we admire them and we put them on a pedestal because, you know, they've brought us to a new learning in music. I, though, found that having interned in a school with a high quality Suzuki program, that I could see more of the music and teach more of the concepts of music than I could in a secondary setting. So instead of the performance necessarily being the biggest part of what I do, it's the building of the foundations and the skills and the humans, because you can't be an elementary teacher and not be able to build relationships with your students. Um, I was offered two jobs on the same day. One is an itinerant string teacher in Orange County, and one is an elementary music teacher in Seminole County. Fortunately, I took a little time and just sat back for a couple of hours because they both wanted to know right away. Um, but I knew myself well enough to know I needed a family or a community of support with um, moving from South Carolina to Florida um, without knowing anyone because I, Orlando was a new place for me and every, all, everybody in my family is in South Carolina. So fortunately, I made the, I feel like I made the right decision because that first job was all about community. Um, teaching is about building relationships and that's what feeds me. I have my students for six years. I get to watch them grow. Um, it served me well. It has introduced me to ORF. And um, once I got into the ORF line of thinking and the approach, it was my third year of teaching and I just felt like everything fit. As an instrumentalist, this was a program that made sense to me and it helped me understand the um, elementary students a whole lot better. Um, I love my job. The kids think I'm a rock star. I don't tell them anything differently. Um, but it also allows me to have time to gig so I can keep up with playing on the side, which is important. And it helps remind us what really is important about the music and that's making music so that when you walk in the classroom, you want to make music with the kids and spend most of your time on that and developing them to be able to improvise and create on their own. During the pandemic, it's been inspiring to see as we've been able to go into the kids' homes. Parents stopped just last week. I was doing with Captain and Tennille's Love Will Keep Us Together. We were doing, um, we were doing something with form and movement and one of the parents stopped in the middle of their walking past and grabbed the kids earphones and put them on and started uh, dancing. I've had grandmas push a kid out of, out of the chair so she could do the movement with us. Um, and one of the things I try to do from March to May is give things for the kids to do that they could go to their family and start making music. Cause I think that's something as a, as a society we've lost, we've become uh, consumers of music and not necessarily uh, participants of music. So one of my goals during this pandemic has been, how can we get the families participating together and building those skills where they feel safe, that they can, they don't have to be perfect and they don't have to be professional, but they can just have fun and create music with their own families. So that's my story. <laughs>
Well, and I, I think one of the common threads that we've heard here tonight so far is that everybody loves what they do. Mm-hmm. And it just goes back to, you know, as you're deciding what to do with your life, maybe you've decided, maybe you haven't, you know, maybe you're just here to kind of explore what opportunities are there. It's really important to do something that interests you um, just to be more successful, to really pursue something that, that you have interest in because you love it. And, you know, the question that, that we get all the time is, are there jobs? There are lots of jobs, especially when you're talking about like an elementary music teacher. I remember um, when I used to work downtown and we would get resumes from people there was one time where we had 15 elementary music jobs open at the same time. And there, there is a teacher shortage right now. And if you're looking for a, for a good job or rewarding career, these are the kind of things you'll, you know, if you want to do that, you'll get a job when you graduate from college. Um, now, so if, if we have questions as we're going, if you have a question, if you'd like to put it in the chat or ask, let me know. I do have a question uh, starting from Mr. Bloom. Um, from Cole wants to know how many people were at the live audition and what is daily life like playing in, in, in a military band? Great. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, the, the audition, there were, I don't know how many applied in the pre-screen round they invited. Uh, no, I do know. There were about 60. I think somebody told me there were about 60 that applied and auditioned. Um, and then there were 11 invited to the audition and it was a four round audition all on the same day. So it was an exhausting day. Um, and daily life, um, right now it's a little, not exactly what the job fully is. I'm still working. Um, but some things have obviously been altered in terms of our ceremonies, but, um, I just go to work when I have to play and that's it. Um, if, if there's not a ceremony for me to do, I stay home with my family and do some work at home. I compose on the side. Um, I will eventually be probably teaching again um, around here as well, maybe high school or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's like I said, most of my jobs are funerals in Arlington National Cemetery, which is where our base is in in Arlington, Virginia. So um, yeah, I go to work. If they need me, whatever time they tell me, I show up and get in my uniform, grab a drum or cymbals and go do the, the, whatever the job is, put them away and go home. And that's it. It's amazing. So let me ask you a question um, before we move on to the next one. If somebody were sitting at home right now and they said, they said you know what, I want to do that. I want yeah. to uh, join the military bands. I want to perform. What should they be doing right now as a college, <laughs> as a high school student? Uh, you need to be thinking about how you can be as good at your instrument as possible. Um, it's, it's a highly competitive field and um everybody in this band has master's degrees and doctorates in music like everybody i mean and these people studied at the best colleges and universities and conservatories you know it's it's most people came the route i did where they they got high level degrees in music they're performers they're professionals and then joined the military there are a few um that maybe joined the military early on and then kind of wound their way through the music route but almost everybody was a civilian musician, professional musician that went this route because it's such a great job. So yeah, that it's practice and find a great school where you can be like as a performance major, that's, that's your most likely route uh, to get as good as you can on your instrument or voice. Okay, and so same, same sort of question now to Matt Brown. If somebody's sitting at home and they say, you know what, I wanna be Matt Brown when I grow up, what do they need to be doing right now while they're in high school? Uh, well, let's see, in high school, there's a good part of, of what I do that is based off of being a good musician. So I would have to say there's, you know, learning your instrument and uh, music in general is uh, very helpful. Um, one of the things that I am told quite regularly with not only the musicians that I work with, but also producers that I work with um, is, you know, that I'm, I'm a very musical engineer, meaning I understand terminology. I understand, uh, I know how to read a chart. So if somebody comes in with a chart for their session, I can read through it. I can, you know, follow along, tell them where we're starting, where we're ending, all of that kind of stuff, um, as well as give performance critiques. Um, you know, you, your ear, everything that I do is based off of my ability to hear 
things and to hear certain like and that could be defined as hearing specific frequencies it could also be defined as hearing rhythmic inaccuracies between players or between a drummer playing by himself you know where his hand and his feet aren't lining up some stuff like that um so it's very very much based off of being able to hear things well so i would say the first thing to do is listen to things differently and i i i as a drummer, I think most drummers already, you know, already start to listen things differently. When you listen to a piece of music, you're kind of focused on what the drums are doing first, at least while you're, you know, a younger player, it's always like, well, what would my role be in this? Um, as an engineer, as an audio engineer, it, it kind of goes the, the other way. And there is no one thing that you should listen to specifically upon first listen, you should kind of listen to everything as a whole and figure out, um, you know, where each part fits into the acoustic picture that you're painting here, you know, like, there's not one instrument that can paint every single color. And if you look at audio, what you're hearing as, as a painting or a picture, you know, the color variances, the shade variances, they all make a very big difference on the overall uh, emotional impact that the listener has or the viewer has. And so the same thing applies in audio with frequency balance, frequency spectrum, um, instrumentation arrangement, uh, how tight or how loose things are. So those all play a part. So I would say start listening to things differently. Listen with the perspective of from a, a larger picture, what does it sound like? And then go the exact opposite and go and just focus on what does this one particular instrument do? And what does it sound like? And how does it sound like that? Um, that's the first part is, is, you know, figuring out if you can listen to the same thing over and 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 over. And I mean, infinity and not get tired of it. Um, and then the second thing I would do is if your high school has a program and, uh, you know, music technology or something like that, of course, uh, participate in that. Um, there's a lot of information online. Uh, that's very good. There's also a lot of very bad information online. It depends on where you're going for that. Um, there's some very quality YouTube channels, but there's also a lot of really bad YouTube channels. Um, so if you're looking for information outside of this, if your school doesn't offer this, there are some online academies that do have, um, that are subscription based that do have a lot of really, really good, uh, viable information from people that are working in the industry and, um, that would be the second place to start. And then as far as outside of school, um, there are some very good um, universities that um, have very, very good programs. There's also some really expensive private universities. Um, some of those are great. Some of those are not. Um, and the reason I would say that is it's not about the student or the teacher at that university. It's about the overall reputation that the university has. Um, in my industry, there are schools that if you went to that school, you have to prove yourself better than the school reputation. And that's really hard to overcome. Um, and it's, so it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, you get the information, you get the, the knowledge, but if you're having to fight the reputation of the school, then that's, it's going to be a really hard, really hard challenge. And a follow-up question to that from Christina. Uh, wants to know as a music business major, she'd like to hear what personal characteristics and professional abilities you utilize to set yourself apart from others throughout your career when networking, pursuing positions in the industry. So what personal characteristics um, and abilities do you have that set you apart from other people who do what you do? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's, there's a saying that when I started playing, playing, music professionally um and and never forget this like it was i was you know 21 years old and i'm playing out at disney and in the break room in between shows um one of the guys that was in the band who was once again he was significantly older than me he was in his mid 40s at you know and i was in my 20s at the time so i thought that was old um but he said to me he said you know we were having a discussion and he said something into the room like yeah it's it's like 90% the hang and 10% how good you are. And, and what he meant by that is 90% of the job in being a professional musician was being somebody that's fun to be around because 
oftentimes when you're a professional musician, you don't really spend a lot of time playing music with that person. You spend more time in between, you know, or around that person than you do playing. And the same is true in a studio environment to re for, I have to earn, well, they, yeah, I have to earn the artist or the musician's trust in order for them to actually listen to what I have to say as far as input on their performance. Um, so I have to learn how to, you know, every person's different. Every there's a little bit of psychology involved of you know what is what is going to work for this person. Are they a, a positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement? It just depends. I, I rarely use negative, but you know there are some people that thrive in that type of situation. And my goal is just to get the best performance as possible. So I would say that would be the first part. The second part is my attention to detail, very detail oriented. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, audio engineering, especially from a sound standpoint, is very unique and fingerprinted. As, uh, like, I don't hear things the same way that anybody else does. And that could be said the same for every single one of you. You all, you might hear it the same, but the way you interpret it, the way your brain picks up on the frequencies, the way your brain picks up on dynamics, the emotional response that you have to that music based off of what you're hearing is different for every single person. And in order to become successful as an engineer on the standpoint of how things sound, your opinion, which is what I put into every single thing I work on is my opinion. This sounds good that opinion has to be something that everybody agrees sounds good. You know, I have to uh, uh, please the masses, so to speak. Um, and then how I set myself apart is kind of making that what I'm putting out there sound as good as what everybody else does or at the same level by, but having something unique. And I think that uniqueness is, is the ability to really kind of separate the instruments in the uh, acoustic field so that when you're listening to something that I've worked on, you can pick out every single little thing that's happening, whether it's loud or very quiet. Okay, and now I have a similar question for Nicole Kirby, and that is, if somebody's sitting, sitting here tonight and they say, you know what, I think I wanna do that. I wanna become a music therapist. What do they need to be doing as a high school student now to prepare themselves for that? Yeah, so um, as we had looked at that program of study, all music therapists will learn how to play guitar. Um, they teach you in school in group guitar, but if you wanted to get a head start and you wanted to kind of start on your own in high school, that would be a great idea. Um, there's a lot of resources on YouTube and on the internet of just how to be able to play guitar chords in general um, and kind of just learn the basics of that. Uh, in addition to that, I would say, kind of think about what population you would be interested in working in and volunteer in something um, that you can start working in that population. So if you like older adults, maybe you can volunteer in a senior center or um, in a nursing home. And if you like children, uh, maybe in a childcare center or at a children's hospital, that way you just kind of get experience working with that population. Um, I know that even when I was in, in college, I didn't have very much volunteer experience in um, certain areas. So I kind of had this predisposition that I wouldn't like working with kids. Um, so my internship was, was in hospice and I really enjoyed working with older adults. Um, and then I, when I was looking for a job, the first job that I got was working with children. And in my head, I thought, well, this is the job I got. So I'm going to take it and hope that I don't hate working with kids. And I ended up loving it. Um, and I, you know, I've continued with it. I work with in a children's hospital. So, um, so just working in different, working with different kinds of populations to just kind of get an idea of what do I like? Um, and even if you can, you know, from going to talks like this, and if you can observe, even if it's not music therapy, you know, if it's, uh, audio production or sound engineering or elementary school, teacher, just any of the, um, the different careers, even if you can observe or um, find a way to like volunteer just to kind of see, am I even interested in it? Or, or, you know, maybe it was something you thought it was completely different, or maybe you kind of like this, um, just kind of being able to get your feet wet in some different areas to really see what, what it is that you're interested in, um, and what you like, because it is different once you get out there and kind of experience it. Yeah, and a lot, lot of good points there. And one of the best things you can do as a high school student is go volunteer 
uh, in different places and do things. And, and I can tell you, and we didn't talk about band director, choir director, works director tonight, because you're probably in one of those programs at school and you see your, your director every day. But when I went to college and I'm, I'm a band director, when I went to college, I didn't want to be a teacher until I volunteered. I volunteered for the first time at a middle school music camp uh, right before my freshman year of college. And it changed my life. And I was like, I want to do this. This is great. Um, go volunteer at your local elementary music program, right? Mrs. Hewitt, can you tell the same thing? If somebody's sitting at home right now and they're saying, you know what? I want to teach kids how to make great music at the elementary level. What do I need to do tomorrow to make that happen? Well, I would check in with your local elementary music teacher because they would love for you to come demonstrate your instrument or your voice or whatever it is you do um, with their kids and with online stuff now, that would be kind of an easy thing to do. But you also need to get yourself out among kids. You need to see how to manage groups of children. So, you know, in the summer, the summer camps, a lot of the band programs in Orange County uh, do have some uh, summer music camps and volunteer and you get your volunteer hours too, but you can find out, you can get some really good strategies helping out in those rooms and um, volunteer at a preschool. You know, they'll give you a group of kids and you'll see, you'll sink or swim real fast. So you got to be able to manage children. And I mean, that's in any teaching situation. You have to learn how to manage the children. Um, so I, I loved what Nicole said about, you know, putting yourself out there in all these different situations around different kinds of people. Yeah. And, and there, there are opportunities in all of these, you know, if you are, um, and I, I've got a couple more questions and I will, I will get to those in a second before we wrap up. But for example, Diego R, if you happen to be in central Florida and you wanted to know more about being a, a producer or a sound engineer, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, somebody maybe on the screen right now that could show you that as long as you stop messing with the drum set here at school. Um, if you're sitting at home and you're like, I, I want to uh, be a musician, join a community band. Or, or some volunteer bin where you get to perform regularly for people. If you're in Central Florida and you're looking, you want to be a teacher and you want to find places to volunteer, send me an email and I, I can I can set you up with somebody. If not, I'll find you. If you're from somewhere else, I can I can help find you somebody. Um, <clears throat> so just this is kind of like lightning round here. So a couple of questions we didn't get to yet. Um, Diego wants to know what school should I go to to become a producer or engineer like you, Matt? Um, before you answer that, we have a policy that we don't endorse particular universities uh, during this. So Diego, that might be something that you might want to ask him um, if you ever happen to meet him in person or by email. Um, you feel free to send me an email and I can forward that on. And um, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. It's, it's, you know, we have a lot of great universities here in Florida. Um, okay, now... Moving on to the next question. If I wanted to be a professor in teaching music at a university, what should I be doing as a high school student to prepare for it? I'm going to take that one for you real quick, because if you want to teach music at a university, the, the number one thing that you should be doing right now is mastering your instrument and learning about as much music as you can. Um, those jobs become competitive. And, you know, first of all, you want to focus on getting that first degree, your music education degree, or if you want to teach percussion at the university level might be getting that performance degree. Um, and you can see some of the panelists are putting their email addresses in the chat. Um, if you have questions that they can answer, you are certainly welcome to email them. You can email me and I can get it to them. But if you want to teach at a college, you want to make sure that you do well on that undergraduate degree. That's step number one and make sure that you are auditioning and getting into a good school of music. Um, and then there was another question on here from um, can audio engineering help me if I want to produce my own music with a software program? I'm more of a vocal performer, but I want to be able to make professional sounding songs. I, and, and Matt, you could speak to this a, a, a little better, but I imagine, you know, a, some free software, Audacity or GarageBand would be a great place to start messing around and, and learning it. Yeah. That is definitely, I would say anything that you can get for free is a good place to start. GarageBand's great um, and it's relatively very easy to use. Um, the, you know, the road to what I do is, is one of those things that's never ending. I will never be good enough at my craft and it drives me nuts. Everything that I listened to that I did, you know, 
as close as like three months ago, I'm like, oh, I could have done this better. And so you got to start somewhere and you'll either love it and love how tedious it becomes and how much time it takes, or you'll be extremely frustrated by it. And if you're frustrated by it, then this is probably not a good fit for you because there is lots of tedious stuff that I do on a regular basis. I spend hours and hours and hours just editing drum takes or tuning vocals or comping solos. And it's, and it's the same section on loop for about five hours a day. So if you're okay with that, then this might be a good job for you. Well, and uh, the last question for tonight, Nadine asked about um, while going to a university for a music major, should you always apply to a music job? And then uh, continuing down here, biggest challenge is networking and getting known. I produce my own music as a high, high school student and a songwriter as well. And I, I'm going to give you some general advice for any of these careers. And if anybody else wants to add anything, feel free. But the best thing you can do to further yourself in any career you choose is to take every opportunity you can. Um, you know, there's two philosophies. You can sit and wait for it to come to you or you can go get it. And if you want to be really great at this and you want to be successful at this, always have your foot on the gas. Any belts of anything they want to add to that? I just like to follow up that what you're saying. And, and you look at everybody who's spoken here tonight and there's a, one thing that's overlooked by a lot of people. And I see it in my industry, but I think it goes across the board is like drive to be, to get what you want is more important than ability. Ability can be learned along the way, but drive cannot be learned. You have to, it's something you have to pick yourself up and, and just go for it. And, you know, I was saying that if you're frustrated by something, you should stop. I didn't mean that in the sense that if you really want to do this, you should stop. I'm, there's going to be more than one frustrating point in your life. And it's going to happen over and over and over. But if you really want to do something, the drive can't keep you from doing it. And ability can be learned. It can be, it can be molded, but drive has to come, you know, from your own, your own position. You can't stop it. Well, and one of the mottos we have here in our band program is 10% more effort will get you 50% more returns. Sometimes that extra effort really does make all the, make all the difference. And I'll, I'll allow one more question because he's been waiting patiently, but Diego wants to know is FL studio good because that's what he uses. It, sure. <laughs> They're all the same. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. And, you know, Diego, if that's something you've got on your computer or your laptop, maybe you can uh, bring it to school. And I, I know Diego is one of our students here at Freedom. I'm assuming that's Diego from Freedom. Yes. Yes. So um, Matt will be here tomorrow and, and uh, you can bring it to school and we can check it out. I'd love to learn what FL Studio is. So maybe you can show me. How's that sound? Awkward pause. And while we're waiting for, for Diego's response, sounds like a plan. Great, Diego. Thank you. Um, that's right. And, and that's, that's the thought we're going to leave it on. A great way to be known. Be so good they can't ignore you. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. We have one more of these sessions left. I believe it's on March 15th, and that's on opportunities for you in college, whether or not you're a music major, some different things that you can do in college to continue to be involved with music. Not everybody's going to major in music, but everybody can make music a part of their lives after graduation. So again, thank you to our panelists. A lot of them put their information in the, uh, in the chat. If you have any questions, I put mine in there too. Please feel free to reach out and I will get you any, I'll get you the information or I'll pass you along to someone who can answer your question uh, better than I can. And on that note, uh, on behalf of the Florida Music Education Association, thank you to our panelists and thank you to our participants for this evening. Have a great night and we hope to see you next month. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Have a great night.